Emil Zola, Blood. Animals by Dan Ribellato. This is how it ends. And this... No! ...is how it begins. Please! Down by the war, boy. Please, you can't. Squad, get ready. Dee Dee! Take aim! Boy! Dee Dee, help me! Hey, boy! Fire! Dee Dee! This story begins in blood and ends in blood, and of blood the story is made. It is a story of France and the story of the 19th century and the story of a family. You heard the name that boy called out, Dee Dee. Let me tell you about her. Dee Dee was born Adelaide Hook to a family of market gardeners in the town of Plasson, which sits in a valley in the Provencal hills in southern France. Here it is, look. Adelaide was born in the family home, which had been built 50 years earlier on the town cemetery. Every so often, bones would work their way out of the ground and pear trees grew, bearing great twisted branches and enormous misshapen fruit. Not many people ate that fruit. As a young girl, Adelaide played in a garden whose soil was damp with sap and blood. Adelaide was a beautiful young woman, perhaps a little eccentric. Her father was committed to a madhouse, and the people of Plassans thought it only a matter of time before she went the same way. When her father died, she was consoled by the family gardener, Mr. Rugon. Oh. Oh. We all need a little consolation now and then. The whole of Plassans stayed away from their wedding. A year later, a baby followed. Say hello, Pierre. <coughs> and shortly after that, Rougon the gardener, while weeding a bed of carrots, died of a heart attack. <coughs> Bordering the family's land, separated by a high wall, sat the one-room hut owned by the smuggler Makar. He would go away for months at a time and return at night. He had danger in his eyes. The town mistrusted him, feared him, but Adelaide saw something else in the smuggler Makar, and it was to him that she turned, after the death of her husband Rougon, for consolation. Oh. Oh. Mm. Mm. Again, the good people of Plassans were appalled. She must be mad, like a father, to be seen with that pirate. That murderer? You know he kills children. Eats children, I've heard. It's a disgrace, is what it is, to Plassans and to France. Mm. And they were even more appalled when Adelaide gave birth to a girl. Say hello, Ursule. <coughs> and then a second boy. Say hello, Antoine. Plassans referred to these two new children as the wolf cubs, as they rampaged through childhood. Oh, you little sh Shame did not come easily to Adelaide, who tolerated even enjoyed her wolf cubs' rampages. Her other child, Pierre, was less amenable, and as he grew up... I don't know why you want to live alone in this big drafty house, Mother. I'm quite all right, Pierre. Why don't we find you a nice little cottage somewhere? Just leave me alone, Pierre, please. But Pierre was not put off. You look cold, Mother. Oh, no. Here, take my jacket. I'm really no need. This big old drafty house freezes the blood, doesn't it's it? It's not cold. What you need is something I smaller. I don't need... Look, toasty and warm, lovely. It's not particularly cold. I don't suppose you can afford to light the fires here. Yes, I'm afraid this place is a real drain on your mother. Pierre, I don't want to hear another word about this. Is that understood? No, but mother... Is that understood? However, Dee Dee's resolve was broken by two events... One night in the early years of this century, the smuggler Makar was challenged by a policeman at a border checkpoint. And in the ensuing struggle, Makar was shot. 
Dee Dee got word late the following evening and her wide eyes staring up at the unforgiving stars. She walked across the field to Makar's cottage where she lay in his bed and felt her heart shrivel inside. <sighs> The grief also opened up a weakness that lurked deep in the family's blood. One afternoon, in her kitchen, it happened. She experienced her first fit. It was a nervous attack, a kind of jolting paralysis of the mind, accompanied by terrible physical convulsions. Every couple of months she would have a fit though preceded by feelings of unearthly delight and joy. The doctors could do nothing. They prescribed rare meat and quinine. It was an imbalance, an unhappy mix of her father's nerves and her mother's heart. It was this dark blood that oozed down the branches of the family tree. Pierre took advantage of his mother's weakness and persuaded her to sign over to him power of attorney. He sold the family home and invested half of the proceeds in the manufacturer and distributor of olive oil, which had just been inherited by one Felicité Pouèche, whom, coincidentally, Pierre had just married. When Antoine heard about it, he wasn't happy. I ain't happy. I'm sorry to hear that, little brother. What you done with the dosh? Dosh? The moolah. What you done with it? The proceeds from the house sale have been securely tied up in sound investments. But I want to... I explained. It is securely tied up. I, with... I don't care about that. I want my bit. Well, you can't have it, Makar. Well, I need it, Rugon. Why? Why do you need it? Stuff. Stuff? Never you mind. Living expenses, bits and bobs. Well, I'm sorry. There's nothing I can do for now. Antoine still wasn't happy. I still ain't happy. And he was soon making trouble in the town. The Rugons are thieves! Highwaymen! Pickpockets! They ain't family! They're a bunch of criminals! The Rugons stole my inheritance! Stole it, I say! The house and its lands worth 100,000 francs in which me and my dear sister was born and raised. The house was stolen from us. Is that justice? No. Is that right? No. So Pierre called a family meeting. Oh, my dear brother Antoine, my dear sister Ursule. <laughs> Oh, I, I want you to know that your happiness has always been my prime concern. Mm, funny way of showing it. The inheritance is tied up in investments just now, but I have not neglected you. In fact, I've worked hard to set you both up in a suitable occupation that will ensure your well-being and your livelihood. Occupation? Sister Ursula, dear beloved sister... It has always grieved me to think what would become of you. Has it? Yeah, born into poverty, into dirt. I speak not merely in metaphors, dear sister. Right. Raised in muck, nurtured in filth. You've made that point, I think. Uneducated, no dowry to offer a potential husband, a face that only a mother could truly This love. better be going somewhere. You know, I, I think, Mr Alfred Murray. The hat maker? Well, he he's a milliner. <laughs> He makes hats. He's a hat maker. What about him? He's taken a liking to you, dear sister. And what does that mean in plain French? He has admired you from afar. He speaks highly of your spirit, your pleasantness, your face even. Nice. And he's asked me if I would consent to your being married... Alfred Marais? Mm, you may know he's moving his workshop to Marseille. Uh -huh. He would very much like you to join him there as his wife. This, this is a bit so... Well, you can think it over, of course. Oh, can I? Yes, the coach to Marseille will afford you ample opportunities for reflection. It leaves in an hour. Oh, wow. What about me, Rugon? You haven't found an aristocrat's daughter who wants to make me a rich man, have you? <laughs> no. Uh. 
Didn't think so. Would that I had, little brother. Go on, then, spit it out. What have you got for me? These. What are they? Your passport to a better life. Better life? Mm -hmm. A life of travel, of fellowship, of the great outdoors. I'm not working on a farm. Of course not. Well, what is it, then? Your call-up papers. Call-up? You've been conscripted, dear brother. I don't want to join the army. Oh, that's not the attitude, lad. Don't you know there's a war on? You bastard. You're going to be fighting for Emperor Napoleon, little brother. Within a week, Ursul was packed off to Marseille with the hatmaker, Antoine went to war, and Pierre and Felicité moved into their new house on the fashionable Rue de la Bain. <sighs> You are brilliant, my love. Well, we, we, we did it together. Oh, this house will become the very centre of Plasson. This room will be full of silk mm. and conversation mm. and laughter <laughs> and champagne. Absolutely. And envy, too. This salon will echo with envy and intrigue. Well, we'll be famous for it. In Felicité, Pierre had found a woman whose ambition even outstripped his own. But first, I shall redecorate. Mm, well, well, why not? What about yellow silk mm. for the curtains? Yeah, well, isn't that a bit bright? Uh, why yellow? To go with the yellow satin wallpaper. Ah! It will contrast with the lemon upholstery and the amber cushions. Well, they're, they're also yellow, though. Uh, I see buttermilk table coverings mm. with golden place settings. And the seats will be upholstered in a xanthus fabric. Mm. Xanthus? It's a colour. How to describe it? Yellow, perhaps? It is. A sort of yellow. So it will all be yellow? Exactly. The yellow drawing room will become the most coveted invitation in Plasson. Hmm. Of course it will. Pierre and Felicité were like bandits, gathering their forces and lying in wait for Plasson, eradicating drop by drop the traces of human feeling that watered down their blood. Felicité began her assault by assembling an army of children. Five in eight years. Eugène, Pascal, Aristide, Sidonie, Martha. Oh. Darling. What is it? Oh, nothing. I'll tell you, Felicité. No. <laughs> I, I suppose I, I, do, I do feel a little twinge. A twinge? A, a pang. A pang no. of what? Mm guilt. Whatever for? For Mummy. Mummy? Mummy. In that horrible cottage all on her own. Oh, you mean Dee Dee? Yes, it's nothing to worry about. It's just, just a pang. You know, I've forgotten all about her. And I suggest you do the same. Does anyone remember poor Adelaide? For a while, after the death of the smuggler Macar, few people saw her. Her skin was pale, her hair grew white. Her eyes became milky. Aunt Dee Dee, it seems, was waiting to die. Her daughter Ursula's story was an unhappy one. She lived in Marseille for many years with Mouret the hat maker and had three children. Say hello, children. <coughs> but Ursula was not strong, and one summer in 1845, she succumbed to consumption. The two older children, Francois and Hélène, were found apprenticeships. But Sylvère was too young, and after being turned away at Pierre's door, Adelaide took him in. Well, boy, aren't you going to say hello to your grandma? Don't be scared, Sylvère. I've got a small larder in the back of the kitchen. I've emptied that out, and you can sleep in there, all right. Going to say thank you to your grandma. Oh, that's all right, boy. You don't have to talk. I know what it's like. I've got no one. You've got no one. So now we'll have no one together. For the first month, Sylvain barely spoke at all. Sometimes he would cry, but Dee Dee was patient. She fed him. She didn't force him to speak. And sometimes she would come back from town with a treat. A pigeon, perhaps. Or a book. Hello, Sylvain. 
Have you even moved from that chair since I left? What's this? You've nearly finished that book. I washed the plates. What a good boy you are. And I broke one. You broke one? I'm sorry. There's always plates. Just take more care next time. I will, Dee Dee. After six weeks, the 12-year-old Sylvère and the 80-year-old Adelaide had formed a strange friendship. Sylvère's shyness disappeared, and to Adelaide's face returned a colour and life that hadn't been there since the night a border guard ended her happiness. Sylvère was a voracious reader. He read books faster than Dee Dee could bring them into the house. Stories, history books, romances, natural science. But what stirred his young mind particularly were books about heroic deeds, people fighting for liberty, battles against tyranny. See, a man who thinks himself the master of others, he is more a slave than they. Sylvère's calming presence even seemed to steady her damaged nerves. Her attacks were milder, less frequent, and she was able to hide them from the boy. Until one day. What do you want for tea, Sylvère? Soup. Oh, you shall have soup. And bread. And you shall have bread. Soup and bread, soup and bread. <laughs> Are you all right? Uh, yes. Dee Dee, what's the matter? Now, you mustn't be scared. Promise me you will not be scared. What's happening, Grandma? Sometimes my mind, it gets too much for me and go. Go now. Leave me alone. I don't want to go, Grandma. You mustn't see. See. <laughs> oh, Grandma, what's wrong? <laughs> Grandma? <laughs> and Sylvia got a cushion and placed it beneath his grandmother's head. And he stayed with her until her legs stopped shaking. When she came to, an hour later, she found Sylvain sitting beside her, holding her hand, reading a book. I'm still here, Grandma. He was a good boy. Such a good boy. <sighs> Excuse me. Age 13, Sylvain was apprenticed to Vian the wheelwright. He learned quickly and soon was able to bring food and books into the old hut himself. At night, he would read his books and in the morning, he would go out and fill the bucket at the well. <coughs> the well was set into a high wall at the far end of the garden. Half of it on one side of the wall, half on the other. Hello! <sighs> Who's that? My name is Marie, but everyone calls me the X. Oh, you gave me a fright. I only said hello. I was surprised. Oh, what a girl. I'm not. I'm not that scary, am I? Uh, I? I can't see you. Look in the water. What do you mean? Well, wait for it to clear. The opening in the wall was only large enough to take the bucket in and out. But as the water stilled, Sylvia could make out the reflection of a girl with raven black hair and a mocking expression. I'm Sylvia. Hello, Sylvia. Um, have you finished with the bucket? Oh. Hurry up. All right. <laughs> Do you live near here? No. I walked 50 miles to get here. Really? No, silly. I'm not silly. Well, who walks 50 miles for a well? Of course I live near here. With your mum and dad? No. I live with my uncle. My mum is dead and my dad is... He's gone away. I live with my grandma. So we're both orphans. Sort of. That's me done. Thanks. I'll see you around. Oi, silly. What? You come here every morning? Yeah. Right. See you tomorrow, maybe. Oh, he's silly. What now? Pass the bucket through. Oh. That day, at work, Sylvain asked at the carriage works if anyone knew a girl who had just moved in nearby. They did. Aye, that's a Chantagray girl. Chantagray what? Chantagray. Murderer's girl. Murderer? He was a poacher. 
The policeman challenged him and he shot him dead right there. What happened to him? Sent us to the galleys. No one knows where he is now. The girl was taken in by the uncle. They don't let her out. Too ashamed. And quite right. Why? Bad blood, that lot. Bad blood. Well, she's just the same. They're all the same. The next morning, at the well... I want to be your friend! I don't need a friend! No, but if you do, I'm here! Listen to this! I'm a troll and I'm going to eat you! You don't look like a troll! No? What about now? I will suck the flesh from your bones and crunch them in my teeth! <laughs> I asked about you where I work. Oh, did you? Yes. They told me about your dad. Well, people love to blah, 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 blah. I want to protect you. I don't need your protection, silly. I'm not silly. Well, I don't need it anyway. But it's not fair. There's the things people say. So? Well, nothing's fair. Why should things be fair? I believe in justice. You what? I believe in justice and liberty and equality as well. You can't believe in justice. What does that even mean? It means doing what's right. Those people aren't going to change. Let them believe what they want to believe. Why make a fuss? Because sometimes you have to stand your ground. Sometimes you have to do what's right. You're a weird kid. I'm not a kid. See you here tomorrow? Maybe, kiddo. Every morning, Sylvia would get to the well at precisely the same time. And every morning, Miette would be there too, one way or another. I thought you weren't coming. So? It's just you, you're late. Oh, did you miss me? No, it's, it's just... Oh, poor Sylvia, Mrs. Little Miette. No, I, I, just, I just thought, that's all. Admit it, you missed me. Well, well, what about you? Well, what do you mean? You're out of breath. No, I'm not. You ran to get here. No, I didn't. <laughs> yes, you did. No, I didn't, so. It doesn't matter if you did. I know. I want to talk to you. You are talking to me. No, but, but properly. This is properly. Not through the well. My uncle doesn't let me out. This wall is too high. So is the well or nothing? In the evenings, Sylvia would sit and talk to his grandma and one night, their conversation turned to Makar. He wasn't what you'd call a good man. He was a bad man. He did some wicked things, I think. I didn't ask him about them. Why not? Because I loved him. Well, even though he did those bad things? <laughs> Maybe a bit because of that. I don't understand. It was exciting, knowing that the town was so angry. Those evenings when I would slip out of my house, walk down the path. Once I was past the wall and I was in here, I felt I was living the life of an outlaw. You were standing up for what was right. I don't know if I thought it was right, Sylvia, but I don't think I cared very much about that. What did you mean, past the wall? This wall, the one at the end of the garden. Once I was past that wall, it was as if I had left Plasson and I was somewhere else entirely. Um, how... I mean, how did you get past the wall? Uh, you didn't climb over it, did you? Of course not. There's a door. There's a door? Yes. I've never seen a door. No. I don't understand. That night, a policeman came to the door and told me that my Macar had been shot and killed. I locked the door and put the key away and I never opened it again. You've not seen the other side of the wall? Not in 25 years, Sylvia. Promise me, you won't ever try. There's nothing for you over there. That evening, Sylvia promised. And the next morning, he broke his promise. Finding the key in the back of a kitchen drawer, he took a trowel and an oil can and the key and he explored the wall inch by inch. Pulling away the vines, eventually the door stood exposed before him. He pushed the key in the lock. And... 
Hello, Silva. Hello, Miette. Your voice sounds different in the open. That different? Just different. You look different from in the water. Bad different. Good different. Definitely good different. Well then. What? You wanted to talk? Yes, I did. So talk, silly. Silly! Dee Dee, I I'm sorry. But she stopped, confused by the gap between her memories of the old house and the sight now before her. As she turned her eyes towards Sylvain and Miette, she felt her nerves jangling, her blood pulsing. <laughs> Dee Dee? <laughs> Grandma? <laughs> What's happening? What's wrong with her? Oh, it's nothing. She'll be all right. We just need to help her. Well, come on. I'm going to put her on her back. You hold her head. Right, you take her legs. I'll, I'll put her on her side. Adelaide's vision blurred. It seemed to her suddenly that the two faces crowded anxiously above her, were spattered in blood. She saw the skies darken. It was as though she saw a flag streaked with blood floating in the air. I'm sorry, Grandma. I understand, Silver. I am, though. Take care. Love can kill people, my boy. Love? <laughs> I don't love her, Grandma. Take care, that's all. From that day on, each morning, Sylvère and Miette would meet at the well, and each evening at ten, they would meet by the door. They would speak about the town, and their days, and their rooms, and their hearts, and books, and ideas, and the future. Do you think France will ever be free? I do, but we'll have to fight for it. Would you ever fight? Really? For freedom? Of course I would. <laughs> Not being funny, but do you know how to fight? I could learn. And on the colder nights, she would wrap her dark brown cloak around their shoulders and they would carry on talking, their breath misting in the air between them. When the day comes and I have to stand up for what I believe, I hope I'll be strong enough. You'll be strong enough. You're amazing. Imagine it. Fighting for liberty. Doing what's right. Obeying no one's rules but the dictates of our own conscience. Silver! Bedtime! Coming, Grandma! Meanwhile, Felicité Rougon launched her olive oil business at every housewife in Plassans. But the Rougon's conquest of Plassans was not wholly successful. The oil business remained stubbornly unlucrative. No, thank you. While picking off the rest with a series of strategic invitations to the yellow drawing room at the Rue de la Bain. Oh. Your tradespeople. And the smart set of Plassans were underwhelmed by their new neighbours. How very fascinating that must be for you. And old antagonisms resurfaced. Whatever is that noise? Hmm? Oh, no. What is it, my darling? Antoine's back. Oh. Antoine had returned from the war more resentful of his half-brother than ever before. At first, Pierre tried to ignore him, but when Antoine started once again making speeches in the town square... What do we want? No. When do we want it? No. Pierre was obliged to change course. What's this? It's a very generous settlement. Generous? You've got a nerve. I understand, sir, that my client makes this offer in a spirit of goodwill. Ha! And does not intend by it any concession to the slanderous claims made by you against his person. It's no slander, Mr Dubois. Ask your client. He oh, knows. pipe down, Antoine. Don't tell me to pipe down, you thief, you highwayman. I must ask you, however, Mr Macart, to sign an undertaking that you will never again repeat these allegations. Yes, that's how you work, isn't it? Contract signature, yeah? Antoine, <laughs> please, calm down. Take the money, buy yourself a suit of claws, get some rooms. Hey, a job, perhaps. A job? Oh, you'd like that, wouldn't you? Trample on the working man, you would, you'd like that. Yeah, so you don't want the money. Don't tell me to calm down the bloody nerve of it. I would remind you that my client is at liberty to withdraw his offer at any time. Mm hmm just sign it, Maka. Just, uh, here, sir.
There. I hope you're happy, you pair of bandits. Antoine did buy a suit. He even bought his own drinks for a while. And before the money ran out, he was lucky enough to meet Josephine, a basket maker and a hard worker. While he sat at home seething at his injustice, Josephine would work to bring home money. And in time, she also gave him three children, Lisa, Gervais and Jeanne. Say hello. Make the bloody noise, Dad. I am trying to read the paper. In the evenings, Josephine would feed the kids and Antoine would drink until his forehead touched the table. And there he would sleep until the morning. This was the happiest time of Antoine's life. He had money, he had a wife, he had plenty to drink, but he still had not forgotten how he had been cheated. Uh, thieves! Uh, uh. But outside Plasson, things were happening. France was changing. For 50 years, the country had been in two minds about the king, sometimes for him and sometimes against. After the revolution, France had become a republic and then, under Napoleon, it became an empire. And after the emperor was deposed, a king was restored to the throne. Bonjour. But then... The king tried to restrict the right to free assembly, and he was forced to flee the country. Au revoir. In 1848, the monarchy is ended for the second time. The Second Republic is declared. In towns across the country, liberty trees were planted to celebrate the new democratic state. This did not always go down well. <laughs> it's a complete disgrace. A tree, of all things. <laughs> it's disfiguring. It's unsightly. Mm, I'm going to do something. What Pierre and Felicité did was to form a salon for the conservative faction of Plassans. They included the almond dealer, Mr. Granou. Breathing. Mr. Rudier, the contractor. At your service. The clerical publisher, Mr. Vouillet. Bless you. Commander Cicado, a veteran of the Napoleonic Wars. Bah. And the Marquis de Carnavon, a dispossessed aristocrat who gave the salon style and took whatever he could. Enchanté, madame. <sighs> Under the influence of their distinguished guests, Pierre and Félicité Rougon became devotees of authority, opponents of democracy more royalist than the king. The king's the keystone of order. Keeps the whole thing solid. Mm. Without a king, everything falls apart. <laughs> Thieves, scoundrels, scroungers, sponges, slackers, yubbles, freeloaders, parasites. Am I right? <laughs> Their son, Eugène, grew up and studied law. He drew up wills and he wriggled clients out of contracts. But life in a small provincial town like Plassans never suited him. And as 1848 broke, he announced to his parents... I'm going to Paris. What are you talking about, Eugène? Things are happening in Paris, sir. What things? What, what do you mean, my son? There are changes afoot in the world of politics. The constitutional changes in how we are governed. Yeah, but you have your law practice here. I propose to sell it and with the proceeds establish myself in Paris. Huh. I want to be part of the future of France, sir. Well, I'm sorry. I forbid it. You most certainly do not forbid it. I... F what? Go to Paris, my child. Do great things. Do the Rougon name proud. I intend to, Mother. And so, at the end of January 1848, Eugène travelled to the capital with one suitcase and 500 francs in his pocket. Stepping out from the station, Eugène set eyes for the first time on Paris. All around him, the houses and shops and theatres and carriages and posters and people and people and people. He felt himself not shrink but grow. He felt his soul expanding to fill the city. 
It was as though his eyes saw through the bricks and buildings to take in the whole of Paris in its grandeur, its wealth, its terrible brilliance. I shall be your mirror. Eugène understood. I will become you. Eugène saw everything. You shall see yourself in me. He saw that a great city needed a great man. Not a parliament, but an emperor. Not a republic, but an empire. I have come to save you. Eugène would restore to France its emperor. But first, I need a bite to eat. After a month or two, Eugène's hatred of France's republican government consumed his every thought. Each minute of each day was spent working for the return of the emperor, but when his speeches went unheard and his pamphlets unread, he had to change to subtler methods. In the guise of an investment advisor, he started to insinuate himself into some of the most important houses in Paris. Oh, I am glad to find myself in a house such as this. Indeed so. I am delighted you say so. To be among true supporters of the Republic. Why, yes, indeed. Long live the Republic, so say I. Oh, so say we all, sir. Oh, nearly all. Nearly all? I cannot name the man, but in the last house I visited not half an hour ago, I formed a grave impression, a most grave impression. Oh, really? Yes. Things are happening, sir. Things are happening. And after some weeks, repeating this nonsense in every house he visited, he began to spread the impression that the whole of Paris was dissatisfied with the Republic. He became known as a source of information. He was trusted as a man with the ear of Paris. And soon, he was invited to meet a rather special man. Mr. Eugène Rougon, Excellency. My deepest respects, Excellency. I place myself entirely at your disposal. Oh, really? Oh, indeed, sir. You may be aware I've been working in your interest these last months. Well, fancy. France needs you. You carry within you the good name of Napoleon. Truly, sir, you are the man of the hour. Louis Napoleon, nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte, heir to the Napoleon dynasty, and a man with his eyes on the throne of France. Well, strain every sinew, etc. Oh, I assure you I am doing so, Excellency. I'm thinking of standing for the presidency. What do you think? It is not my place to advise you, sir. Humor me. I think you should stand. But I think, too, that the presidency should only be the first of two steps. Whatever do you mean? France does not need a president. It needs an emperor. A second empire? Well, well, well. That would be fun, I suppose. <laughs> Am I to continue to act in your interests, sir? Do as you please, Rougon. You won't find me ungrateful. Sir. That evening, Eugène wrote the first of many letters to his father, explaining that the Republic's days were numbered and to prepare for a new French empire. Gentlemen, um, I'm not at liberty to discuss uh, any details, but I have recently received information that forces sympathetic to our interests are as we speak, working to bring an end to this foolish atheistical experiment. Protect <laughs> it from this republic. No, 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 no need, gentlemen. No, within a year, I say to you now, the republic will be no more. <laughs> Pierre was not right. Louis Napoleon was elected president in 1848, but the Republic remained intact through 1849 and 1850, to the dismay of some. Radicals, anarchists, reds, communists, fanatics, extremists, liberals. Am I right? <laughs> and the delight of others. The Orleanists are still agitating for a restoration of the monarchy. Idiots. France will never have a king back. 
I don't think so either. I like being a citizen. I don't want to be a subject. A citizen? Standing tall? Standing on our own two feet. Fighting for dignity, justice. Standing our ground. Standing up for what we believe in. Breathing freedom like we breathe air. Imagine it, Miet. I am. I'm imagining it. By 1851, Eugène and his friends had been dripping poison in Parisian ears for so long that all Paris, even those sympathetic to the Republic, believed its days were numbered. Eugène had stood Paris on its edge, and it needed only the slightest touch to make it fall. Excellency, the Parliament becomes more unpopular by the day. I believe that before this year is out, we will be in a position to dissolve the Parliament in the name of the people and have you declared absolute ruler of France. Well, if you say so, Rougon. You just give me the nod and I'll do the rest. And so the signal went up. The first shots were fired. Louis Napoleon put the army on the streets. Parliament was dissolved and the news did not take long to reach Plassans. I am delighted to announce that His Excellency, Louis Napoleon, has suspended the Parliament and brought down the Republican government. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Smack a strong leadership needed, you follow me? Yes. And well, I would like to propose that the yellow drawing room of Plassans gratefully accepts Louis Napoleon's generous assumption of power. And furthermore, I propose that he be crowned Emperor of France. Seconded. Anyone against? Gary. Yeah! <laughs> Have you heard? Heard what? The President's dissolved the National Assembly. But he can't do that. He has, though. Well, someone's got to stop him. They are. What do you mean? Guys told me in the yard rebel groups are springing up all over France. There's one gathering a few miles outside town. I'm going to join them. Well, I'm coming with you, then. <laughs> no, you're not. Oh, am I not still there? But, but you're a girl. Well spotted, Mr Equality. No, I, I, I don't mean that. I just... I, I mean, I... I don't know what's going to happen. It could be dangerous. But then I'm definitely coming. What? Why? Someone's got to look after you. Oh, come on, then. If you're coming... <laughs> what, what, what the devil? What's going on? Uh, Pierre, what's happening? Uh, oh, it's that damn full brother of mine. <sighs> What's he saying? Oh, he, uh, he, he says that the, the, the rebels are coming. The rebels are coming? Oh, he's just drunk. Ignore him. Oh. We'll discuss it all in the morning. Get, 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 get some sleep. Out beyond the Rue de la Banne, out beyond the town's walls, two hours down the Nice Road, Sylvère and Miette are looking for a group of brave men and women that they have never met and of whose existence they have heard only wild rumours. Are you sure? De Burrell told me they'd be here. Who's De Burrell? He's a butcher. A butcher? Oh, it doesn't matter. He said they'd be here. Oh, it's bloody cold. It is bloody cold. I don't mind turning back. Doesn't mean we're giving up. I want to find them. <laughs> uh, what's the joke? <laughs> You've got your serious face on. No, I haven't. Yes, you have. When your mouth goes all little and you frown like this. I do not look like that. You do and all. I'm just concentrating. I'm not saying it's bad. In fact, I, I think it looks quite cute. I'm not trying to look cute. I, I'm, I'm trying to join a revolution. But wait. What? Shh. Do, do you hear that? Oh, that's them. Be careful. Why? Could be, you know. What? The other lot. Right, well, let's keep quiet. Follow me. No, you follow me. This was my idea. But I heard that. No, you are so annoying. Why are you doing that face again? I'm not doing a face. I know what you have here, then. <sighs> well? My name's Sylvain. Mm. I'm from Plassan. I, I've come to join you. Join us, eh? I want to join the rebellion. No rebellion round here, lad. Just me. That's not true. Oh, and how do you make that out? Because you said us. So I did. I want to fight for freedom and justice, sir. Well, if you're going to fight for something, I suppose there are worse things to choose. And who do I have the honour of addressing, sir? My name's Bagar. I'm a blacksmith from Castle of You. Who's your friend? A comrade. A comrade, eh? Well, you and your comrade follow me. 
Oh my gosh, this is so amazing. I know, right? Oh, we're like totally joining a revolution. So awesome. <laughs> 150 men stood or sat in a clearing in the woods. Woodcutters from the forests of the cell with their axes freshly sharpened. Hunters from La Palud with rifles. Peasants from the Midi with pitchforks and scythes. Short jackets, smocks, some with red sashes. Others in the uniforms of armies they had deserted. Everyone eating, thinking, talking, drinking. Gentlemen, we have two new recruits. This is Silver. All right. Oh, and this lad in the hood is... Uh, sorry, I didn't catch your name. I'm Marie Shantigray. But people call me Miette. <laughs> you didn't say your comrade was a girl. I'm a comrade. And I'm as good as he is. Is she? She really is, actually. All right, then. It's really annoying sometimes. Marie Miette. I like that. We set off tomorrow morning. Want to hold a flag, Marie Chantigray? I'd rather have a gun. Have you ever fired a gun? No. Then take the flag. <clears throat> Where are we going? Orcher. That's the other side of Passan. Yep. Thought we might pass through. They won't give us too much trouble, will they? Uh, no, I... Uh, no. You get some sleep, you two. Tomorrow's going to be a long day. The next morning, the rebels met with battalions from Estonel and Sainte Anne and then began to march toward Plasson, at their head Miette, proudly carrying aloft the red flag of the Republican cause. Yes, we'll raise up a flag you look amazing. How cool is this? At the same time, in the yellow drawing room, plans were being laid to defend Plasson. Gentlemen, Fires have been sighted in the hills to the west. It's clear that the, uh, the rebels are massing. Fanatics for democracy, friends of anarchy, enemies of the empire. But will Plassans fall? No, no, Plassans will not fall, for we, we shall defend it. <laughs> now, first of all, How? we need to est establish... Uh, uh, what? How will we defend it? Well, well we sh shall obviously... Um, um, uh, Commander Sicardo, uh, how shall we defend Plasson? Well, fight like lions. Ah, no, no, no. there you see. We'll be massacred. My butcher says there's supposed to be 2,000 of them. First whiff of grape shop, they'll scatter. No backbone, you see. Show of strength, old spirit. Do we even have any weapons? Uh, mm -hmm. Yep, indeed we do. Uh, uh, Commander Sicardo has placed a supply of muskets and ammunition in the old cart shed by the ramparts. I've never shot a musket in my life. Hammer to half cock, charge ball, wadding on top, ramrod, tamp, 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 gunpowder, full cock, point and fire. Child's play. Very good, very good, yes, yes, sir. Uh, this is our moment, gentlemen, the moment of which we have talked for so long. I refuse to believe that any man in this room would not take up arms to defend the glory of the French Empire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I offer myself as your captain. Permission to speak, Captain. Of course, Mr. Granu. Yeah, I'd like to volunteer as your sergeant. Yeah, very good, Sergeant. Oh, I wanted to be sergeant. You can be corporal. Voulez, you can be my lieutenant, and Carnival, you, uh, you can... Uh, wait over there. Now, look, man, I'm, uh, I'm proud of you. What a fine body of true-born Frenchmen you are. The rebels are not expected until this evening. We are all to be ready in the town square, prepared to fight to the death. Oh, darling, you will be careful, won't you? Oh, my lord, please. Please don't concern yourself with such matters. I couldn't bear to see you taken prisoner. No, fear not, madam, that will not happen. Oh, there. good. There, you see. Probably just shoot you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. What, what, sorry, what? No, can't waste rations on prisoners. Nope. Up against the wall, bang, bang, blood on the cobbles, dead before you know it. You, uh, you didn't mention that before. Thought it might spoil the mood. Yes, it would have done. And nothing wrong with a bit of blood. Blood makes things happen. Blood is a good fertilizer. Uh, Commander Sicardo, might I suggest that my husband lead a second company? A sort of backup company, if you will. If the first defense is unsuccessful, he can rally the troops for a counterattack. Well, would you be prepared to lead such a company, Captain Rougon? Uh, if, if need be. Oh, then it is decided. I myself shall gather volunteers to defend the Meralty against the hordes. You, Gradu, Vie, and the Marquis, you stay in your homes. Well, if you say no, the best. Good, good tactical thinking. As the next day dawned, Captain Pierre Rougon stood bravely at his post, peeking through the shutters. 
Your brother's here to see you. What? No, no, don't let him in. Too late, you rascal. What do you want, Antoine? Just came to give you some friendly advice, brother to brother. I don't need your advice, Macar. When the rebels arrive, give yourself up without fuss and we won't harm you. We? We? What, what have you got to do with it? Well, I'm the man on the spot, ain't I? You know, the old rabble rouser. Oh, yeah, I think it'll be very useful to our friends. Now, look here, lad. Oh, no, 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 there'll be no more of that talk. No, no, no more talking down to the working man. Working? When did you last do a stroke of work? I'm just saying, dear brother of mine, is we can avoid all unnecessary bloodshed if you just give yourself up. What? Get out of this house. Go on, you're a monster. Oh, don't you worry, I know when I'm not wanted. Oh, hold on. What? Listen. I think that's them. Yes, yes. I think my comrades are here. Oh, well, I'll be off. Join me, brethren. Good day, brother. Good day, dear lady. <sighs> Dirty little man. Yeah. Hey. He's right. They're here. How many are there? Oh, um... Oh, good grief. Uh, there must be 500 of them. Can I see? No, 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 no. Keep back. Oh. Go on. Uh, uh, in fact, go and lock the door. Go on. Uh, barricade it if you can. Uh, yeah. Uh, Let's see what these creatures do. Stop! I am Commander Georges Sicado, veteran of the great wars of Emperor Napoleon. I command you to leave this town immediately. I am armed, and I am prepared to defend this town. We have no quarrel with the town of Plasson, Commander Sigardo. Then leave, sir, and take your rabble with you. These men are tired and they're hungry. We will not disturb your town for more than one night. We ask only for some food and that we might sleep here. We will leave at daybreak and I assure you, no one will be harmed. I'm giving you a count of three to begin your retreat. We come in peace, Commander. One. Two. Three. <laughs> what happened there? I fired upwards. Why? It was a warning shot. You sure you didn't miss? Of course I didn't miss. I fired in the air. It's what you do. The next time you'll shoot at us. Yes, I will. Will you give us a count for that as well? Yes, probably. I haven't decided yet. Well, go on then. As you wish. Just... Give me a chance to reload my musket. Oh, just go and get the silly old slug. <laughs> the rebels streamed into the town hall. The few soldiers on guard were easily disarmed. The town's leaders, the mayor, the receiver of taxes and the postmaster were taken prisoner before Sicado had finished reloading. You lad, so there, wasn't it? Yes, sir. Take this gun, keep an eye on the soldiers. Me? Don't worry, son, just for an hour. I'll send someone over to relieve you. Yes, sir. You? In the town hall, Sylvain stood guarding the six soldiers in a mixture of excitement and terror, counting down the hour. Oi. You, Ked. What's your name? Oi, I'm talking to you. <laughs> Does your mum know you're out this late? My mum's dead. Can you believe this? A little kid. I'm 18. I'm not a kid. You know, you're going to get into a lot of trouble, sunshine. I mean it. A lot of trouble. I'm fighting for justice. <laughs> oh, of course you are, boy. Don't you think the time for play acting's over? I'm not play acting. <sighs> Why don't you give me that gun, eh? Sit down. Are you going to make me? Keep back, or I will shoot. Have you ever shot a gun, boy? Didn't think so. And why don't you hand it over? The soldier reached out his hands and grabbed the gun. The two men, young and old, struggled for possession, but... Stay back! He's hurt! What did you do? I did nothing! It was an accident! He's bleeding! He went for the gun! You saw him! I can't see! I can't see! You blinded him! I didn't do anything! Oh, great yellow shit! What's going on here? He tried to get the gun off me and he got hurt. Let there be a lesson to you, sir. I left young Mr. Silver in charge, and that means you sit there and behave. Go and get a doctor. He should get his eye oh. checked out. Yes, sir. Ah! Mr. Berger! What do you want? 
Well, now that you've conquered Plassan, I humbly offer my services as mayor. You haven't conquered Plassan. We're leaving in the morning. No, what? No, you can't do that. This is a hotbed. A hotbed of counter-revolutionary imperialist running dogs. No, 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 you don't want to leave this lot unsupervised. They seem harmless to me. We have that idiot Cicador locked up. No, I assure you, this place is dangerous. You need someone to keep an eye on the locals. Well, really, I don't know. Look, just give me ten of your men and I'll take charge after you lot have gone. You can have five, but no trouble. Understood? Understood. Good. Comrade. Yeah, yeah. Long live the Republic. Yeah, thank you, yeah. The following morning, as promised, the rebels left at daybreak, leaving a handful of their men and Antoine Macar occupying the big chair in the big office in the town hall. I could get used to this. Antoine put his boots up on the big desk and gazed at his reflection in the big mirror. Oi! You! Finger! Yes, sir. You got any vino in these cellars? Vino, sir? Yeah, got a wine cellar down there by any chance. Nice little drop of brandy down there, have you? Do I understand that sir would like some refreshment? Yeah, that's right. And make it snappy. I'm in charge now. Around the corner, on the Rue de la Banne, Pierre had woken at dawn and watched the rebels depart. Uh, who, who's there? It's us, Rudier and Granou. Oh, uh, You see them go? Yes. Vagabonds, thieves, scoundrels. You know, they've left in charge your brother. Oh, the little worm. I might have known he'd take advantage. So what do we do? Right. We, we uh, round up a few of our most loyal friends. We, we get guns from Sicardo's store and we make a recce of the town hall. Good idea. Good idea, Captain. Uh, yes, Captain. Right, come on, come on. Armed with muskets and jumping at their own shadows... Twelve stout champions of empire made their cautious way through the deserted streets of Plassans. Shh, 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 quiet. Right. right now, men, this is the uh, town hall, and it's most likely that the rebel forces will have made this their base. Fanatics, vandals, delinquents. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Sergeant. Yes, yes, Captain. Corporal. Sir? Um, you go in the front door... Right? You, you take a look inside and see if there's anyone guarding it. Why me? Don't be insubordinate, Corporal. Oh, well, I must. Look. Then, right, we'll, we, we'll wait here, and if you come under attack, right, you give us a shout, and then we'll come and rescue you. Rescue me, that's a love. I'll be dead before you pick your gun up. Will this take long, Captain? Quiet, in the ranks. Only it's quite cold, you see. I have some mittens you can borrow. Oh, it's lovely. Pass them all on. Shh, shh. Look, he's coming back. So, there's one guard on duty. Right. Is, is he armed? Well, I suppose it rather depends what you mean. What? what, what well, is he or isn't he? Because he's got a gun. Oh, oh dear. But he's also asleep. Ah, so, so you see, sir, it's actually quite a hard question to answer. Um, uh, Sergeant Grano, uh, bring Clement and Picou. Uh, sir. Uh, come with me. C Corporal, you too. Sir. Pierre bravely crept into the town hall where the guard sat sleeping in a chair, his gun beside him. As the others trained their muskets on the guard, Pierre gingerly picked up the gun. Oh, oh ha, hey! You are under arrest. Fair enough. Oh, very well done, sir. <laughs> yes. Flushed with the success of his first great military campaign, Pierre summoned the rest of his men, and they slowly made their way upstairs towards the mayor's office, where Antoine sat composing a proclamation. People of Plasson, the hour of freedom has struck. Now, wait, wait. people of Plasson, the long-awaited hour of freedom has arrived. Are you getting this? Yes, sir. The reign of justice has begun. Oh, I, I like that. Yeah. The reign of justice 
Who's that? Probably the wind, sir. The reign of justice has begun. Rejoice ye, for liberty is at hand. Can I say ye, or does it sound a bit stupid? Mm. Is somebody there? <laughs> yeah! Sorry, I think that was me. That was really loud. That minute, what you have just broke is 150 years old. Was? Antoine Macar. I am placing you under arrest. You in whose army? This is the Imperial Plassans Army of His Excellency, Louis Napoleon, the ruler of France. What? This lot? Don't be impertinent. Is this a joke? No. No, it isn't. Look, you wait till my comrades hear about this. They'll be back in a flash, and then the boot will be on the other foot. Mm -hmm. I control this town now, Macar. First in line for the guillotine, that's no. what you are, Napoleon. No, 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 no. No one's going to be guillotined. I'm making a list. I'm going to get all your names on it, and when the rebels come back, they'll round you up. Oh, yes. Oh, I've had enough of this nonsense. Grano! Uh, take him and lock him up. You where? You. Uh, w uh, what's next door? The mayor's dressing room, sir. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, uh, lock him in there. You, you won't win, you know. Come on. My friends are co coming back. Yeah. Rise up, you children of a country, the glory of Corporal, would you go, go and fetch my wife? You might want to let the town know that it's been liberated. How do we do that? A proclamation, sir? Very good. Yes, a proclamation. Uh, what about this? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, people of Plassan, the long-awaited hour of freedom has arrived. The reign of justice has begun. Rejoice ye, for liberty is at hand. Yes, excellent. Yes, have that uh, posted up across town. Uh, certainly, sir. By lunchtime, the town hall was filled with people wanting to hear about Pierre's brave deeds. Quiet as mice, I order my men to follow me as we prepared our final assault on the enemy's citadel. We could hear the traitor inside, preparing, no doubt, plots and stratagems. I gave the signal, and we stormed his fortress. I got the leader by the throat. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I said to him, you, you're finished. Your, your evil reign over the good people of Plasson is over. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, kill? No, 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 there's, there's no need for that. Oh. Tell them about the bullet. Oh, yes, yes, you, the bullet. As I grappled with the Republican devil, a shot rang out. The bullet flew through the air. I turned my head just in time as it passed within a hair's breadth of my right ear. <laughs> the bullet continued on its lethal path, my men scattering to avoid it, until the accursed projectile found its object. This ancient, beloved mirror, a gift, I'm told, from Louis Catoz himself. Oh, what? Yeah, yeah. I, I wrestled the gun from a traitor's hand, and the Empire was saved. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How many rebels did you have to fight? Yeah. Um, how many was it? I saw 50. Yeah, I saw 100 at least. Uh, mm, all in all, we must have put 300 rebels to flight. Oh. What if the rebels return? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think that's very unlikely. Well, in, my, in, my in any case, I'm expecting reinforcements. When? Yeah, when? Uh, soon. How soon? Soon. Soonish. Oh. Friends, friends, please, do not be alarmed. I give you my word. His Imperial Majesty's army is, is on the march. Fifteen miles outside Plasson, the rebel army was actually on the march. All right, this place looks as good as any. We'll stop here for 20 minutes. Take a rest. They had been walking without a break since dawn. Even Miette's flag was drooping. Let me help you with that. No, it's all right. I can look after it. I know you can. Are you all right? Yes. Why? I've barely said anything all morning. There was a soldier back in Plasson. 
It was an accident, but I hurt him pretty badly. Well, what sort of an accident? He tried to get my gun. Well, then. I know. I have some cheese and bread. Will you share it with me? Thank you. Yes. Let's go there. We can sit here. Give us a bit of privacy. Miet? Yeah? Are you scared? Why are you? I asked you. No, I'm not scared. I am. I'm very scared. So am I. You never seem scared. When my uncle first took me in, the local boys found out about my dad shooting that policeman. They used to call me the murder girl. Say they were going to kill me. Oh, they didn't mean it. Well, I didn't know that. Kids. Anyway, I learned not to look scared. What scares you now? Losing the battle. Losing my courage. Same here. Losing you too. Same for me. I don't like it, Silver. I'm a strong person. I know you are. You're the strongest person I've ever known. Well, I don't care if I die. But I care if you die. And that makes me hesitate. What if I promise not to die? Well, I'm serious. I'm serious. I'm really going to try not to die. You make me weak, Silver. I don't want to make you weak. Maybe you should go back. Oh, Mia, you don't mean that. Well, I don't know what I mean. I want to be here with you. Well, I want to be here with you, but you make me weak. Why? You know. What do I know? Don't make me say it. Make you say what? I've bloody gone and bloody fallen in bloody love with you. Well, say something, you big silly. I don't know what to say. Well, that's encouraging. No, I just... I I, I, I don't... I've, I've never... I've... Right. Well, I'm going to give you five seconds to finish your sentence, or I'm going to kiss you. You can't kiss me. I, I'm trying to do a revolution. That's it. I warned you. I'd quite like to do that again, please. Me too. The lips contain a high density of nerve endings which, when stimulated, produce feelings of addiction, want, need and pleasure. A cluster of experiences which, for convenience, we also call love. The more they kiss, the more they flood the brain and the more you fall in love. See the blood rising to the cheek, see the eyes shining, Silver and Miette fallen in love. Miet. Silver? I want this never to end. Well, does it have to? No. Should we get married, do you think? First, the revolution. Then we get married. It's a deal. All right, everyone, back on your feet. We need to get moving. What is this place, anyway? Oh, it's a cemetery. What? Well, look, you're sitting on a grave. Uh, don't forget the flag. I won't forget it, husband. That evening, in our share, the rebels danced and sang and ate and drank, knowing that the morning would bring the final battle. Well, you seem a little nervous, darling. Of course I'm not nervous. Why, why? Why should I be nervous? It's just you look nervous. Not at all. Well, the way you're pacing up and down. It helps me think, woman. I'm jumping at every sound. This is sheer nonsense, my dear. You need to inspire the people. Poisson is entirely behind me. Well, let's hope so. I'm sure they are. Incidentally, hmm? have you heard from Eugène at all? No, damn it. If Eugène had not written, thought Felicité, perhaps the coup had failed. Perhaps their boy was in a Paris prison. And even now, Republican soldiers were coming to liberate Plassans and overthrow Pierre. And if they did that, Felicité would surely follow. So Felicité made a decision. Where are you going? Out. What, what do you mean, out? Felicité had remembered that when the rebels had first taken over Plasson, they had arrested the postmaster. So she went to the post office and spent the morning searching through the unsorted mail for news. She found a letter in Eugène's elegant hand, opened it carefully and absorbed its contents. With a grim expression, she made her second decision and paid an old friend a visit. Oh, here she comes, on bended knee, no doubt. 
To arm citizens, form battalions. You can stop all that now, Makar. I have a proposal for you. I bet you do. More tricks? Not at all. Go on, then. What is it? I want to offer you your freedom. My freedom. Yeah, right. Your freedom and 1,000 francs if you will do one thing for me. All right, let's hear it. I want you to gather a rebel army and take back Plasson. You what? I think I've been quite clear. You want me to overthrow your own husband? I do. You've fallen out, have you? That is no business of yours. Sounds very dodgy to me. I can offer you half the money up front. Five hundred? Yes. Now? Yes. And I can walk free? Well, I'll have to make it look like you escaped, of course. Six hundred and you're on. Oh, you drive a hard bargain, Antoine Macar. No one pulls the wool over my eyes. A window smashed, a ladder misplaced. Within an hour, Antoine had left Plassans heading for Orcher. Darling? Yes, my love? Do you think the rebels will come back? Why? Why? What have you heard? Oh, nothing to worry about. But the people are liable to be concerned. What? What do they say? Their fearful husband. Concerned that the rebels may come back before reinforcements arrive. Ah, provincials. I hear talk of inviting your brother, Antoine, what? to be mayor again. They didn't. Oh, one person even raised doubts about the story of the bullet. How dare they, the insolence. Indeed, what ingratitude. But what, what, what can I do? Listen to what I have to tell you and do exactly what I say. People of Plassin, I know you are concerned, but you have no need. I, Pierre Rougon, guarantee your safety. Imperial reinforcements are, even now, surely making their way to us. If the rebels do return, I am confident we can resist them. Do not, do not be alarmed. I am, um... um as your mayor. As your mayor. I pledge to defend the town myself. I pledge to defend the town myself. Even at the risk of my own life. Even at the... Ri what? The risk of my own it, life. Even at the risk of my own life. Know this, Plasson. Know this, Plasson. Pierre Rougon is ready. Pierre Rougon is ready? At Auxerre, the rebels kept a lookout for imperial troops. Sir, sorry to disturb you. What is it? You have a visitor. Who is it? Antoine Macar, at your service, comrade. I thought you were Gordon Plassant. Oh, well, yeah, that, that's what I'm here to talk about. I told you it was a dangerous place. What happened? Treachery. That's what happened. I was overpowered by superior numbers. But you escaped. Ah, well, you see, that's when it becomes interesting. Go on. The mayor, that's my half-brother, lackey of the emperor, lickspittle of the reactionary forces... Well, his wife wants to come over to our side. Does she indeed? She does. And she's asked me to get your men to come, take back the town and overthrow her husband. Can you trust her? I can. Yeah, I've a good nose for these things. Plus, I know. It's hardly worth it. Oh, on the contrary, comrade. If you let the Empire keep Plassan, what, what sort of signal does it send out? No, no, you need to crush him. Show me a mean business. It has some strategic value. Not half. And the Imperial troops don't seem to be here yet. There, you see. I suppose we could take back the town, keep a larger force there, and block off the Nice Road that way. Only thing I ask. What's that? I want to be the one who puts Pierre Rougon under arrest. We'll see. The rebel forces gathered their equipment and began the march to take back the little town of Plasson. You look tired, Silva. I'm all right. How about you? Do you want me to take the flag for a bit? No. I carry the flag. It's bad luck to give up the flag. I don't believe in luck. You believe in liberty. Uh, I was going to say science, actually. <laughs> Same thing, you silly. Oh, considering how rude you are, I think you're very lucky that I love you. I can't help it. I'm irresistible. What will you do when we retake the town? Get some sleep. Me too. In my old bed, maybe. But first... I need to see my grandma. Oh, yeah. Dee Dee, I'd forgotten about her. Does anyone remember poor Adelaide? When she found her dear Sylvain Gant and his bed not slept in, her heart hammering in her chest, she went out into her garden, she went through the old door, 
She looked out across the old field where the bones of old Plassans once lay. Something dark stirred in her, a feeling of dread, a feeling that something would soon be broken that could never be fixed. In the yellow drawing room, with the doors and windows closed, Felicité sat and awaited the confrontation. In the town hall, Pierre Rougon paced anxiously and awaited news of the reinforcements. It was nine o'clock that evening the rebels passed. For a second time, through the gates of Plassans, they marched with determination and purpose to the town square where they assembled, armed with pitchforks and conviction, Miette's flag still held proudly aloft. Pierre Rougon! Pierre Rougon, show yourself, you usurper, you rogue! The rest of the town watched and listened, trembling behind their shutters. Come out, you coward! You thief! The Republic is at your door! Show your ugly face, you old fool! What do you want, my cop? Give yourself up, or we're coming in! I have no intention of surrendering to you, my car. Oh, no! Well, that'll be the worst for you, Pierre Rougon. Is that your brother? Yeah. How many others are in there? Oh, no more than five, I reckon. His little crowd. This is a message for all of you. Leave this square. Leave Plasson. Return to your homes and none of you will be hurt. You hear that, lads? If you stay here, I will be forced to take action. I'm quaking in my boots, Rougon. Very well, gentlemen. Onto the balcony stepped a tall man in the uniform of the French army. Who's that, then? I am Colonel Masson of the French army. Put down your weapons and surrender. Surrender, Macar, or we fire. <laughs> surrender, he says. Who's going to make me? Put down your weapons immediately. This is your final warning. Is your wife up there? Don't leave my wife out of this, Macar. I'm warning you. Oh, I'm so scared. I don't like this. What's an army officer doing here? Oh, he's just some old fool in fancy dress. What do you say? Shall we storm the building? From the street that led the square to the south stepped a uniformed soldier, then another. Two more came out of the road to the east. Another appeared on the west side of the square, and still they came. Twenty, forty soldiers stood in the moonlit square. Each held a rifle. You heard your warning? Men! Fire at will! The first shot blew off the Wheelwright's jaw. The second oh. shot lodged in a cart maker's stomach. The third bullet struck a pig farmer in the throat, a fourth embedded in a baker's shoulder, knocking him to the floor where he bled. A fourth bullet smacked wetly into a chandler's groin. Through the smoke, in disbelief, Antoine saw his brother aim his carbine directly at his head. Don't shoot. Don't, don't, don't shoot. Don't shoot! Pierre lowered the weapon and stared down at his brother. Antoine turned and sweat, running cold beneath his shirt, ran from the square. What do we do? What do we do? I don't know! I don't know! Oh, get behind the fountain! Oh. I said you two! You can hide! Get behind the oh. fountain! Oh, they shot him! They just shot him! I am Colonel Massa of the French Army. You are surrounded. Put down your weapons and surrender. You, with the flag. What? You, with the flag, step forward. What do I do? What do I do? Stay here. Don't move. Step forward or we open fire. I gotta do it. Don't be stupid. I got to. Be it. Girl, lower the flag. Lower the flag or my men will shoot. No! What are you doing, Mia? I'm not putting this down! Lower the flag or we open fire. They wouldn't dare! But don't be stupid, Mia. You saw what they did to the others. Lower the flag and place it on the ground. I refuse! I am giving you a count of five to lower the flag. I will not! Please, Mia. Five. Sometimes you have to stand your ground. Four. Sometimes you have to stand up for what's right. Three. Sometimes you have to hold the flag. Two. One. Miette! Miette! Stay with me. 
Mia, it's me. It's Silver. Silver. Get a doctor. It's going to be all right. Mia, it's going to be all right. Hold my hand. Squeeze it. That's right. Keep talking to a lad, no matter what. Stay with me, Mia. Talk to me. Think about what we discussed. Yes, the things we talked about. We're going to be married. You and me. And we're going to have children. Two or maybe three children. And, and a house on the Corsa there. We'll both work. Of course we will. And, and we'll share out everything. Work hard. Live as equals you and me. Miet. Miet. Her heart. Her warm heart. Her brave, fiery heart had stopped. Her blood was still. Miette's heart was growing cold. Miette! <laughs> You're now a prisoner of the French army. Get on your feet. <laughs> well, look who it is. The snotty little kid who tried to break my face. <laughs> oh, don't cry, kid. There's always more tarts out there. <laughs> <laughs> the soldier took Silver and bound his hands, dragging him off to join the other prisoners. As Silver looked back, he saw Miette on the ground, wrapped in the red flag, her big eyes staring sightlessly at the sky. I think that went rather well. Thanks to you, my darling. Yes, I suppose it was, wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I was rather good, too. Oh, yes. And don't forget to write to Eugène and thank him. Yes, all right. Yeah. Without his reinforcement. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, uh, Colonel, you came not a moment too soon. We arrived. That's what matters. Mm -hmm. uh, what will you do with the uh, prisoners? They'll be executed. Oh. Is that absolutely necessary? It is. Understood, Colonel. To His Imperial Majesty. His Imperial Majesty. And Colonel Masson and his soldiers walked their prisoners from Plassans past the city walls until they found themselves on a bare patch of ground which once bore a market garden and before that a graveyard. No! Please! Stand by the wall, boy. Please, you can't! Be quiet. There! Please! What's that? Let me stand by the door in the wall. All right. Please! All right, kid. And Silver took up his place by the door on the patch of grass on which, over countless nights in another time, in another world even, he had stood talking to a strange, beautiful girl about justice. Squad, get ready. Dee Dee! Take aim! Boy. Dee Dee, help me! Hey, boy! Fire! Dee Dee! Is he dead? Yeah. Are you? What's on the other side of this door? Used to be an old woman. Can't remember her name. Weird. Like a witch or something. She can't still be alive. Does anyone remember poor Adelaide? Some say she died. Some say she moved away. But I did not die. And I did not move away. I, Adelaide Fook. A century old and full of hatred, blood in my mind and ice in my heart. What did I bring into this world? Wolves. Nothing but wolves. I have raised a family of wolves. What did I do? The blood of the Ruka, the blood of the Makar, it's my blood. My blood that seeps slowly through France, my bad and broken blood. The night in my garden, I heard my Silver call to me, and the bullets slam into the old door. I was found the next morning. I had clawed my face raw with grief. My son, my own son, placed me here. Laid to let the madhouse. I am told this is the very room in which my father died. But 
I am not dead. I have watched their years. I will tell their story, crime by crime, blood by blood. They are wolves. Wolves! Gentlemen, I, uh, I, uh, I think we should congratulate ourselves on a most satisfactory outcome. <laughs> France is safe from socialism. We have as our country's helm a man of destiny. <laughs> Gentlemen, I propose a toast to Emperor Napoleon III. Napoleon III. And now I suggest we eat. <laughs> May I suggest we raise a glass to your Imperial Majesty's health and the Second Empire. The Second Empire. They're all wolves. I curse you. I curse you, Rugon. was Glenda Jackson, Pierre was Robert Lindsay, Antoine Ian Hart, Felicite Fenella Woolgar, Sylvain Ashley Margolis, Miette Shannon Flynn, and Eugène was Robert Jack. Colonel Masson, Secado, and Emperor Louis Napoleon was Jonathan Keeble. Berger and Rudier were Seamus O'Neill, and Ursule was played by Kate Coogan. Animals was dramatized by Dan Rebellato from the work of Emile Zola, and directed by Pauline Harris. <laughs>